Hello, everybody. It's Tim Spector here um, uh, talking about COVID-19. I'm joined by Claire Steves, uh, Professor Claire Steves, um, who was really my uh, co-colleague uh, who really helped get us through the, the COVID pandemic uh, using the amazing data of the twins. And what we're going to do is just go through a little bit about how the twins uh, helped fight the pandemic, how we use the twin resource for their purposes. And uh, we're going to go through some of the few highlights of the real key research that you guys managed to help us with. And uh, we're going to hopefully get time for some of your uh, questions. So uh, Claire, do you want to start us off? And what, what are your memories of um, what happened back in uh, March 2020 uh, when we started to think about this? Wow. Well, it's quite shocking, isn't it? Think back to March 2020. All of us were very anxious, weren't we? Um, and that included the twins as well. And um, we had to stop twin visits, actually, sort of as things really um, started to become clear that the pandemic was affecting us as well. Um, one of the first things we did was to, to stop the twin visits. Um, and so that gave us a bit of a hiatus here. And I remember being here in the department, um, Tim, almost uh, everybody else had decided to stay at home and you and me were here. And, and we were thinking about how actually we could use our um, understanding of epidemiology and using um, a, a national cohort um, like Twins UK to really try and help understand this strange disease that was affecting um, the whole world. Um, and so, Tim, we, we sort of, uh, had a brainstorming session, didn't we? And we sort of uh, worked out a few plans. Um, and you guys in Twins UK have been really integral to some of them. Uh, yeah. So we'll go through now. That's right. So we said we must be aware of using the power of the twins uh, during this early days of the pandemic, which we thought, you know, could just last a few months, if you remember, um, not, not years and years to uh, help science in this in a way and, and of course it was only really when we uh, started thinking about how would we communicate you in a pandemic when it was difficult to get into the office and things and do things the normal way that we came up with the idea by talking to our uh, my colleagues at the company Zoe that I helped co-found who are real experts in the app and have been developing the nutrition app that some of you've been involved with on the predict studies to try and modify that app for the purposes of COVID in a, in a very sort of non-profit uh, way. So it was when those two ideas came together, I think, that suddenly they said, this, this is reality and we can roll this out first to twins. And if, it, if you're going to do it to twins, well, actually, you could also do it to the, the rest of the UK population, but use the twins for extra special uh, intensive research. And that's really, I uh, think, how it all uh, happened as far as I can remember um, and um, it, it was all a bit of a blur those few few months because I remember uh, Claire you were super busy working in a like a nurse you know looking after patients in a nursing home uh, who were one of the first to get affected etc it was it was a, a tough time to think clearly when uh, you know the hospital was sort of crumbling around us. Mm. But that was the thing in a way. So I suppose because of that sort of direct exposure to people that were getting COVID and also my colleagues, nursing staff um, and so on, also all being infected, that we could see some of these early symptoms, which really helped us then um, to very quickly put all of that knowledge into um, the design of an app that then could, we could use. And one of the things that, that I think twins really taught us, Tim, is that we, we've been working for a number of years on how geography affects disease and how maybe twins who live in urban environments and who live in country, countryside environments have different effects on health. So we've been thinking about geography and health for some time. And so it was that knowledge and that uh, ability to understand how we can use geographical location that was really important in then developing uh, a national in, a national app that could really report then on hotspots of COVID across the country. Um, so it's really down to the twins. But Tim, we, we did a lot of stuff actually with the twi tw twins um, uh, cohort on its own, as well as COVID. And we, we should really talk about some of the amazing research that the twins cohort have contributed to through direct 
um, you know, engagement in studies all the way across the pandemic, which has just been absolutely phenomenal to see happening, hasn't it? Yeah, and particularly in lockdown, uh, where we had an amazing response, where you know everyone was super frightened even to answer the door, and yet you know uh, twins were very receptive to people coming to visit them. And uh, I remember that was a, a very moving time, really, when uh, the twin mobile, as we sort of called it, was about the only car on the road uh, going going around the whole of uh, Greater London and the southeast picking up samples uh, from twins, which were uh, really unique samples, weren't they, Claire? Just No, that's right, yeah. And so it was... Yeah, it was using those, sorry, Tim. It, it was using those samples from um, all of the individuals that are within a sort of 80-mile radius of London um, that you gave us, that we were able to see um, how um, COVID was spread, spreading throughout all of the population in the southeast, and we could see what the relationship was between antibody status in terms of exposure to disease, because we knew then, but we, we certainly knew even more with the data that you gave us, that actually not everybody who, got ex who were exposed and had the virus had the same symptoms. So we could look at the relationship between symptoms and um, antibody positivity. But also we had this chance as well to create a biobank of samples through the pandemic, which we've now used to really understand how that's how both the pandemic, the lockdowns, things like that, and COVID itself has affected aging of the cohort. So really interesting findings coming from that, showing that there's been a big effect of the pandemic overall um, in all of us, and then a small, thankfully, short-lived effect of COVID in individuals that got it. Yeah, and before we get into that, just the, I mean, obviously, twin studies, you know. The reason we have identical and non-identical twins is to look nature v nurture. And when the pandemic came out, there were these stories about very different responses, some people getting no infection, other people ending up in intensive care. Uh, and we thought genes were the likely reason for that at that time. Um, it was a reasonable guess anyway. And we hoped that twins would answer that question for us. And um, I think I would say the results were mixed, weren't they? So, um, as you said, we were trying to work out whether there was a clear relation between symptoms and antibodies. And it turns out it wasn't that simple, I think, is the, the way that, if I recall. So I think we found that uh, symptoms were reasonably heritable. There was some where the twins got the same symptoms uh, when they got infected. There was some genetic component to that, whether it affected the lungs more or the nose more or skin or general uh, facilities. But it didn't seem to pad out when we looked, took the blood samples, did it, Claire? Well, actually, we weren't surprised about that so much, really. I mean, that one of the reasons why we're looking at geography is because we know that infectious diseases spread through proximity and geography. So when you look at antibody responses, unsurprisingly really we didn't see much effect of heritability um, whereas when we looked at symptoms as you say and in particular I was really interested in that acute confusional state that we identified we, we were one of the first that really identified was a, a core feature of um, COVID-19 in older people um, that um, that actually that that the, the sort of acute confusion that sometimes happens in the context of infection that's quite a heritable factor um, and so that's that's quite important as well in understanding um, what the mechanism is behind uh, the development of delirium and also temperature, Tim. We published a paper on from the twins um, on temperature regulation in the normal state when you're not affected by um, illness, when you're coming into the twin visits um, against temperature when you are in the context of coronavirus. Um, uh, and so that that another important um, study that the twins have been involved in. But that actually brings up the point that actually there's no such thing as a normal temperature because our normal temperatures are actually really quite different. So all these amazing machines that are around for testing people uh, are probably pretty useless because we all got to, it varies, how much, just remind me how much it varies, uh, Claire, the real temperatures? Well, so so interesting. So the temperatures can vary. I mean, they vary across the course of the day, but also within individuals. Where, you know, when we when we when you come into twins, we always measured use of it at eleven o'clock, 
Um, so everybody's sort of halfway through the morning. And still we see con you know, considerable variation in temperature. And it really depends on sort of um, two main things, really, um, but body mass index and age. Um, and then we see as well as that, a genetic effect on, on temperature. So there's a variation across the population. But really, really importantly though, in older adults, we see that actually we need to bring that temperature threshold down. And that's what we were able to show with this study. So just, just, just to clarify, so if you're, uh, if you're on the older and skinnier side, your normal body temperature is gonna be lower. Yeah. And therefore uh, you may not notice getting a fever because you might still be below the official uh, threshold for a fever, but you might feel it and you might be shivering and, and sweating, et cetera. But the thermometer actually might still say you're within normal le limits. Is that, is that correct? That's right. And so we, we saw um, that that threshold that sort of Public Health England put out at the time, which was 38, uh, th um, 37, 8 in older adults should be down at 37.4 or 37.3 or 37.4. Yeah. OK, so that was really that was really important. It just shows this huge variety in what is normal that we're discovering more and more. And that's particularly where twins are useful because we can separate, you know, how much genes and, and environmental impacts are on what 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 we call normal. So we've talked about how twins have contributed to the biobank, you know, storing those early samples. When people were fresh, they hadn't, not like now, they've had COVID two or three times and had all kinds of vaccines and, and things to mess up our bloods, but it was all uh, virgin territory back then. Uh, they also gave us um, stool samples, didn't they? And um, uh, just give people an update on that. I know the study's not finished yet, but um, uh, have they shown any... Because I think if I remember, we, we, the main reason was to look at uh, twins who'd had severe disease or perhaps long COVID and see whether their stool samples uh, yeah. showed anything there. Yeah, so that's a very interesting. So we've looked at um, uh, differences in microbiome depending on how severe someone's COVID was and how long someone's COVID lasted for. And we really didn't see... Um, differences in the microbiome in the end. But what we want to use those samples for actually, Tim, is really interesting, which is something else that we've seen across the pandemic through, through a number of studies that we've done. Um, you've answered questionnaires on um, your physical activity, your lifestyle over the pandemic. And we saw a really big dip in physical activity that people did. And also changes in diet, where some people change for the better, some people for change for the worse. Um, and what we can do is we can use those samples that we've taken in the middle of the pandemic to really see if we can um, identify whether or not there's been shifts in the microbiome across the population, not dependent on COVID and long COVID in those cases, because we didn't find a signal there, but dependent on the changes in lifestyle. And that's just one of the example of the studies that we're going to be doing with all this really valuable data that the twins have contributed over the pandemic. And don't forget from the bigger study, uh, you know, on the general public, we did show there was a clear correlation between diet quality uh, and uh, severity of COVID. So we, we did, we, we think this is all linked. So uh, we, we still think the, those gut health samples really are extremely valuable. Um, tell us, in, a, in summarizing in, in, you know, years of research in a, in a few sentences how how else have uh, twin studies uh, helped the sort of international uh, research um well one of the things that you've managed to do do over the over the whole of the pandemic is uh, really report back on how your health is how your lifestyle is and how indeed your mental health is and so we've contributed to a really you know a very good number of um, studies across the pandemic that we've done together with other longitudinal population studies in the UK as part of Patrick Valance's national core studies. And we've been real vanguard in that regard with, with, with um, the analysis of the twin data. So, for example, understanding the effect on mental health of the pandemic, the effect of furlough on people's experiences across the pandemic and most importantly on long COVID. And many of you have come in to have um, really detailed physiological tests um, together with other groups um, where we've looked at um, long COVID and how the physiology of the brain, the heart, 
the lungs is working in people who have long COVID uh, against their sisters who um, didn't have long COVID. And in more cases than not, when one sister or brother got long COVID, the other one didn't. Isn't that correct? It wasn't there were more cases of discordance than concordance. Uh, more cases of discordance than concordance. But we also do have some individual, some pairs where both twins were affected. Um, maybe um, quite a lot where one got short COVID and one got long COVID. But we're looking at all those dyads to really unpick. It's very useful to have the twin design there to be able to unpick the effects um, of long COVID uh, on the whole body. And we'll be reporting on those, um, uh, those studies and those findings in the next year. And of course, some of the technologies we started to use in the pandemic, because we, you know, we couldn't get uh, involved the hospital at all, and we had to do everything remotely, have really advanced a lot of the way we're going to do research in the future. So have you, have you got any good examples of things that we're now always going to do in a different way than we did before? Yeah, we've got a fantastic example of twins um, that were involved in a study called Remote Promote. Uh, and this is, uh, it was originally going to be called Promote, which was around protein and uh, physical function or mobility um, in our older twins. Um, and what it was all about is about actually a trial using twin pairs where one uh, of the twin pair took um, protein and um, a probiotic, a probiotic, um, uh, sorry, a prebiotic, so something that um, fosters a, a good gut microbiome, and the other took uh, protein and a placebo. Both of the twins uh, were generally having a low protein intake, and we had to do that all remotely. So amazing, uh, the sort of effort by all the twins and all the staff to be able to deliver that over Zoom really interesting new way of doing science. We can do these things remotely. We've been able to validate that we've been able to um, measure things accurately. And going forward, we're gonna be incorporating much more of that remote assessment in our visits going forward because we know that it works and actually it's quite good for both twins and for um, the science. And uh, talking of that, a lot of the twins uh, kindly agreed to stab themselves and get some blood uh, and send it back to us for, for some of these experiments. Um, and I think the one most people remember is what we call the Thriver study. Um, got any results from that yet you can share? Yeah, I do. And hopefully um, if you're um, uh, an e eager beaver, you can have a look on MedArchive. Um, the, the paper is still under review, but it's a really interesting paper looking at how antibodies respond um, to infection and also to vaccination. Um, and I guess one of the key findings that I thought was really interesting from that, Tim, mm. was that um, people may have had varying responses to the first two vaccinations, really. So, for example, we saw people who were um, quite frail or who had comorbidities maybe not mounting such a good response to the initial vaccine. But when they were boosted, especially when they were boosted with the BioNTech having had uh, the, the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine before, really what we saw is a levelling up of those antibody responses, which correlated with what we saw within the big population studies that actually the booster um, really was very protective um, uh, in those uh, in older people. I think that's probably going to be the case for this new booster, this double, double booster, um, which is going to be specific for Omicron as well. So it's really good to see that. Um, that was something nice to see. And there was no great... Uh, heritable effect of the response to vaccine. Is that right? We saw there was no genetic effect or I can't remember exactly. Yeah, so um, no, actually we, we did see um, some, some effects. And again, that changed over the course of the, of the vaccine. It's all sort of like, you know, it, it, after you get to your booster, it doesn't really matter. But we did see a heritable effect of the initial response to the first vaccination, absolutely. Okay, so there's a, your genes determine a little bit of how many antibodies you're gonna produce. Uh, in response to that's why there's always a, a minority of people who don't get a good response and that we think that's mainly genetic rather than anything else is that is that right uh, well and related to some other things that we know affect the immune response so for example um people have noted that in in chronic kidney disease or in cancer there's been a muted response and we saw that across those comorbidities but also um in people who took immunosuppressant drugs and people who are very frail which we know 
frailty is associated with a change in your immune system as well. Um, so those things as well as genetics, Tim. Okay, um, and just, just to wrap up this section, just tell us how the twins are fitted into these other bigger national studies that were you know, commissioned in a way after our twin study, because we were the, pretty much the first to get going, but um, a lot of other ones got there. How, how did they fit into this national framework? Yeah, so it was really very exciting to work together with um, national longitudinal, um, other non longitudinal studies that maybe don't have a twin design, but we'd obviously developed a lot of the materials for the questionnaires that you've been contributing to, and we shared them with um, others and also um, modified our questionnaires over time, dependent on uh, other people, other scientists' ideas. Um, which allows us to have this really amazing national resource that we've put together in a very um, safe environment where researchers can access all of that data together called the UK Longitudinal Linkage Collaboration. But one of the really key things, Tim, that the, the twins really helped with is that you're such an engaged cohort, we could actually ask you about what you felt about questionnaires, things that we were doing all the way along. And you were really very positive. And our volunteer advisory panel um, met with us very frequently to discuss how we were going to sort of really change and operate over the pandemic. And it was that consultation that we were really able to share with other longitudinal population studies um, so that they could really understand how um, cohort members might be feeling about certain different sorts of questions or um, ways of approaching scientific problems. Um, so we're really thankful um, that you've been able to contribute to that because that's really helped lots of other studies across the UK and across the world. Okay, now uh, we've got to just finish up with a few of your questions, and I, I noticed we've actually answered a few of them, um, particularly about, I think most twins want to know, does, does COVID-19 have the same effect on twins? And the answer is no. Um, uh, but uh, we've got several questions asking us, if, if there is a reason one twin gets it and the other one doesn't, what are the sort of, uh, what have we learned about, on average, you know, the, what is it about the, the one that's least affected? You know, what makes them healthy? Do we know from our studies? Are we any closer? Yeah, so in terms of long COVID, um, we've been looking at that quite carefully. It's, really, it's actually been quite difficult to unpick it. And I think it's a really, really important clinical question. What is going on with all of this difference in the symptoms that people have? So we've got several projects that are actually sort of still going to report. And we've seen some, for example, differences in pre-pandemic metabolic responses, which seem to be affecting outcomes. So it seems that there's certain metabolic parameters that might be related to nutrition. They might be related to sort of, you know, general cardiovascular risk and lifestyle things which seem to be related then to the COVID outcomes. But the, the, the work is not totally clear yet, and we haven't fully published all of that data yet, and we're still um, sort of using it. Um, that, that's one thing. And then other things are, um, you know, really strong effects of previous existing uh, conditions, which then play a part in terms of how things develop in COVID. And I don't think that's because necessarily these pre-existing conditions cause COVID, or COVID to manifest in a certain way. But what it does is it means that the body and the system uh, of an individual has a different reserve capacity. So if you have a really big reserve capacity, say imagine um, you're a marathon runner, as it were, let's take that example, and um, you have a hit, something affects you, COVID affects you and it causes a dip of 10% in your function. Because you've got a massive reserve capacity, that won't actually affect your daily life, really, unless you're always working at that top maximum. Um, but if you're somebody whose you know, physical, physiological reserve has really sort of reduced down a bit, then you might then get over that functional threshold of really detecting it. And I think that's what's happening both in the brain, uh, in terms of cognition, and also in terms of um, mental health uh, um, sort of consequences like depression, anxiety. But it's also probably ha ha happening in terms of the lungs and cardiovascular fitness as well. In general, um, that the fitter, leaner twin was less likely to get severe COVID than the, uh, the than the less healthy twin. But of course, 
as many of twins have pointed out, there are lots of exceptions to that. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we, there are lots of things we don't understand uh, about this. But so we, we're just talking on average. Uh, and Tim, I think one of the things that really comes in here with an infectious disease like COVID is about the ex the initial exposure. You know, and I think that's that's a kind of wild card that's in the mix there that can throw things off. So. Um, for example, if someone's had a really big viral load that they've really um, been affected by a lot of virus um, in certain consequences, maybe, you know, at a certain time of day or a certain you know, time when they're more vulnerable, gets into the system more and then basically they have a worse effect. Whereas someone who's sort of uh, maybe affected by less virus to start with, but also their system was in a robust state at the time when that happened maybe that was different so that i think these things probably explain some of the differences as well which make it quite muddy to understand um, yeah well that, and that's the big luck element yeah. and i think a lot of twins are saying oh is it strange you know my twins had this uh, three times i've not had it yet um we were hearing a lot of, of this about um Certainly many of my colleagues and friends saying, aha, I've got super immunity, I haven't had it yet, you know. And then of course, wham, in the last wave, they got it uh, two years after everyone else didn't, didn't feel so smug. And I think it comes back to this idea of just like our microbes are different, our immune systems are incredibly individual, aren't they? So it could be that as the variants subtly change, um, our immune systems are, better or worse at coping with each of these little variants. And so um, even identical twins might respond differently to uh, the same variant, uh, their immune systems, because their immune systems are not uh, identical by any means, because they are, a, uh, in a way, a part of their life, you know, their whole life experience um, and what other infections they've had, et cetera. So, I think it's it's been quite interesting because it's been different to most of the other diseases we've been studying uh, in twin research. Uh, and it was certainly open, open, opened my eyes because I hadn't studied this for about 30 years, uh, infectious diseases. So I had to do some quick learning. Uh, but it is one of the most interesting but very complicated uh, branches of um, epidemiology, isn't it, to get to the, the basis of this. Uh, of how our genes, our environment, our lifestyle, and as you said, just a matter of hours about when you were exposed to the virus, whether you got it at night or day, can influence your response uh, to it massively. Um, or who knows whether it was whether you blew your nose or you know wh whether you had a nice salad for dinner or, or a steak. We don't know, uh, but all these things in theory uh, could play a part. Um, okay, I think we've. Um, is, is there anything else, any other things you wanted to, um, any other studies uh, you wanted to mention? The, the co convalescence um, study? Um, maybe you so want the to convalescence study is a study we're doing together with others in the, uh, in, um, the, the longitudinal population studies. And this is really about trying to understand long COVID, what are the mechanisms behind it? And as I said, we'll be reporting on that in the next year. But Tim, I guess the um, the only other thing to sort of like say really is that um, through the pandemic, we've um, really, um, thanks to your really hard efforts in, in um, doing questionnaires, doing blood tests, sending up in the samples and the questionnaires to us or on doing them online, we've developed a really comprehensive understanding of what happened in the pandemic. And we're gonna be looking at that as things go out past the pandemic as well, because we, we're really interested and in, I mean, everybody's really interested in what the long term effects um, for different parts of our society are in terms of uh, the COVID um, experience, not just the disease itself, but also uh, the lockdown financial implications, um, it's lifestyle changes, um, etc. And so that's something that we're going to be continuing to do research on over the next years. And I think we'll be continuing to find amazing in insights from the incredible amount of data that you've given us and the research community. So I think we'll wrap it up there. Thanks for those great questions. I hope we've managed to answer at least some of them. Um, and if you've been uh, listening to us, you've been helping us with our studies, you realize what a big uh, 
contribution you guys made to uh, fighting COVID, uh, you know, the sort of silent army behind the, the scenes that has been uh, really uh, doing amazing things for science and, and for this country. And, and, you know, the idea was to protect the NHS. And I think uh, everyone did a fantastic job there. So you should all be very proud of yourselves. Give yourself a round of applause. Uh, we're not out of the woods yet. We've probably got another three, three years of COVID, hopefully getting milder. Your data is going to keep being uh, incredibly useful to us. So thanks for listening. Uh, do share it with anyone else who hasn't seen it. Uh, and thanks from me. And thanks, thanks so much from me and the team. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.